as the country looks forward to the COVID crisis hopefully easing in the coming months. The dangers for the Chancellor will only increase. In many ways, managing the economic recovery is the moment of maximum danger for Rishi Sunak, something he's probably well aware of as he prepares for his second budget on Wednesday. And I'm pleased to say the Chancellor joins us now. Thank you very much for being Good morning, Sophie. with us. Um, I'm keen to talk about the budget, of course, um, but just firstly on the roadmap that we saw, which feels like the, the way out for the economy as well as uh, of the pandemic. Um, I understand, of course, you say that it's going to be driven by data, not date. So does that mean if the data is better than expected, that roadmap could happen quicker than you've laid out? Well, what the Prime Minister laid out was a series of steps with appropriate gaps between them for us to understand the impact of each step. And as he said, what we want is a cautious but irreversible approach. Uh, that's why we've taken the approach that we have. And uh, those will be the earliest dates that we think we can do the various things that we've, we've laid out. But we're doing everything we can to make sure that it is hopefully irreversible. That's what we want to see. What, what I don't understand is if you say it's driven by data and not dates, but you say it can only move in one direction, as in it can only slow down, but it can't speed up, then it doesn't really feel like it is driven by data. It feels like it's driven by dates. Well, it's, it, it wants to be cautious, right? Because I think what we want, and as you talked about businesses before in your opening, what businesses don't want is a stop-start approach to this. We want to know that it's a one-way road, and that's why it's cautious. We've given the earliest of dates to give a sense of uh, timing and a sense of direction, and then obviously we might have to adjust those if things are not going exactly as we would like. But look, the, the early signs are, are promising. We're seeing great news with the rollout of the vaccine, not just the take-up of it, but also the efficacy of the vaccine. The data that we're getting is showing us that it is working. So I think that should give us all a sense of confidence and optimism about the future, that we can make progress on that roadmap, and as you said, hopefully slowly get our lives back to normal. I'm sure so many businesses are going to be hoping to feel that confidence and optimism but of course it's been a really difficult time for so many uh, different businesses across the UK. You're announcing a new grant scheme. You just tell us a bit more about what the idea is. Yeah well we know that particularly businesses in the hospitality, leisure, accommodation and retail have been affected by the restrictions and they're still closed uh, in the coming weeks and will only open slowly and still with some restrictions. We want to support them as they reopen, we want to support them to keep staff, to pay bills and that's why we're launching the Restart Grants, uh, which we paid in April, worth £5 billion in total, but up to £18,000 for a particular hospitality business on the larger side. Uh, and those will be paid through local authorities to over 650,000 business properties across the country to help them as we reopen and get our economy going again. A lot of the businesses um, who are going to be affected by this are high street firms. Are you worried about the long-term consequences of the fact everyone's been shopping more online during the pandemic. And is this something that you might be looking at to try and help the high street and perhaps looking at targeting some of those online companies? Well, well that's why we've put in place this, this grant scheme, the Restart Grants, because businesses that have been forced to close uh, multiple times over the past year uh, actually employ millions of people. And what I care about is protecting as many jobs as possible. By supporting those businesses to protect those jobs, that's what this grant will do. And they've been hit in a way that online firms haven't been, frankly. And, and that's why we, we've put something in place previously called the Digital Services Tax, which I announced at last year's budget, which is a tax on online marketplaces. Uh, we're working with our international colleagues, actually, this year, and I'm doing that through the G7 and the G20 group of finance ministers to find an international agreement on taxing uh, digital okay. companies. Uh, but look, our, our high streets are really important. That's why we have the High Streets and Towns Fund. That's why we've done planning reforms. That's why we're now providing generous cash grants to help those businesses get back on their feet, keep their staff as we reopen in the coming weeks and months. OK. Now, when I announced you were going to be on the show today, I was inundated with questions from people. Um, one of them uh, is from Andy. Now, he says, I work at Manchester Airport. The aviation industry has been badly affected by COVID. Will the furlough scheme last for a while longer? It's due, of course, to finish in April, but the restrictions are not going to lift all the restrictions won't lift till June. Well, when it comes to support in general, I said at the beginning of this crisis that I would do whatever it took to protect people, families and businesses through this crisis, and I remain completely committed to that. The Prime Minister, in, in the roadmap, set out a path for us to recover and reopen, and I want to support people and businesses along that path. So, so it that's is going to be extended. I'm not going to comment like. on specific policies, but I want to make sure people realise that you know we are going to be there to support them. And if you look at our track record, we went big, we went early, and there's more to come next week. With regard to airports, for example, they had a generous break on their business rates over this past year. 
the furlough scheme I know has been helpful for many people employed in that industry. I know how difficult it is, and I want them to have the reassurance that we are here to keep supporting people as we reopen the economy. But Andy wants specific reassurance on the furlough scheme. Well, I, I, Wednesday is budget when we'll set out the next step of, of everything. But Andy and others, you know, hopefully will have had reassurance over the past year, knowing that we've done absolutely everything we can to support businesses, families and people through this crisis. And we remain, as you can see by today's announcement, uh, supporting our high street businesses committed to that goal. Once restrictions are eased, is that going to be the time to start winding up some of the support packages you're talking about? Well, I think it's right that the support aligns with the roadmap. So the Prime Minister's roadmap has a path on which we will uh, slowly reopen our economy. And we want to make sure that our support uh, supports people along that path. And that's what you will see on Wednesday. And, and we've been doing this for a while. Our support has been adapting and evolving. Remember, back in July last year, I set out our plan for jobs. That's because protecting and supporting and creating jobs is my number one economic priority. Tragically, three quarters of a million people have already lost their jobs. Uh, I want to make sure that all of those people have fresh hope and opportunity. So this weekend, we also announced that we are doubling the bonus that we provide to companies to hire new apprentices, for example, up to £3,000 for apprentices of any age. It's an example of us continuing to adapt and evolve policy to support people into work. Um, one more question. This is from Petrina. She wants to know, are you going to be removing the £20 a week increase in universal credit? Yeah, again, Katrina, budget on Wednesday is a, is a place where we'll set out all of our uh, next stages of our response. Uh, but I know that that uplift has has made a difference to people over the past uh, past 12 months. It's you know one part of a comprehensive plan that we've put in place to protect people, you know, particularly those on low incomes. And looking forward, you know, we can point to the fact that we're increasing the national living wage next year by above inflation, which will mean almost a £350 pay rise for someone working full time on the though, national living you've wage. You've said that you, you touched on the difference it makes to people, though. Would it not be unfair to remove that uplift, if you, as you call it, before the restrictions end? As I said, we, the Prime Minister's roadmap sets out a path and we want to support people along that path and people will see that on, on Wednesday, whether it's with the national living wage increase, support in, with new apprenticeships, whether it's support for businesses. It will remain committed to supporting businesses, families and people through this crisis. Now, you say you want to support people through the crisis. Of course, that comes at a cost. UK debt now around £2 trillion. How worried are you? Well, we've just been talking about the support that we've been putting in place as a result of coronavirus, but coronavirus has also just had an enormous toll on our economy. And I want to level with people about that, uh, about the problems that that causes and the challenges that it presents us with, and be honest about our plan to address those. OK. Um, I mean, some would argue that, you know, interest rates are low. We should be relaxed about borrowing money because we can do so cheaply at the minute. I mean, you just look at Joe Biden, for example, in the US, with this big stimulus package that he's announced. Is that a view that you subscribe to? Well, we've got a stimulus. Again, just worth bearing in mind, we've spent almost £300 billion over the past 12 months supporting people. Uh, so we, we are doing that and we will keep doing that. But, but we've got the future. Yeah, we've got rega regard to the future, as you said. I think it, it's, we do have a challenge in our public finances. And if, if we don't do anything, borrowing will continue to be at very high levels, even after we've recovered from COVID. Debt will continue to rise indefinitely. And that's not a good situation for a couple of reasons. I mean, firstly, if you think about how I've been able to respond during this crisis, I think generously and boldly and comprehensively, that was only possible because we entered the crisis with strong public finances. I want to make sure when the next shock comes along, whoever's sitting here can do the same thing that I've done. They need strong public finances to do that. Back to austerity so, then, se like the last secondly, government did. Secondly, you talked about interest rates, and you're right, interest rates you know, have been at very low levels, uh, which does allow us uh, to afford slightly higher debt levels, but that can always change. And we're seeing that in the last few weeks. People will know about that when they think about their own mortgages, for example. You know, when interest rates change, what can I afford? So we have to be acute uh, to that possibility. And thirdly, we also want to deliver on our commitments to deliver strong public services, and I, and I want to be able to do that as well. So for all those reasons, you know, making sure that we have strong public finances is important. That's why I want to level with people about the challenges and set out our plan to address that. You mentioned the risk of increasing interest rates. Are you worried then, like, in the summer, there's a lot of pent-up savings, for example, interest rates could actually rise and have a serious impact on the public finances? Well, in terms of, you're right, there are pent-up savings. And as we saw 
last year as the economy reopened, we saw that spending come back, which is great, and we want people out and about. That will help drive our recovery. I think the other thing that I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, there was also business investment. Mm -hmm. That has taken a toll over the past 12 months, and we want to see business investment also playing its part in driving our recovery. And you, know, you can rest assured that we'll be looking at every possible way to support our economic recovery. So at what point, then, do you start looking at trying to bring some of that debt down? This budget? This year? Well, at what point? Well, I, I, I think there are two things. One is we want to keep supporting the economy, right? Because of the restrictions are still in place, there's a roadmap over which they will lift and will provide support for people along uh, that path. And I remain committed to that, whether it's with apprenticeship bonuses, support for high streets, as we've seen today, or the various other things that we're doing. We announced the creation of a new national infrastructure bank as well uh, this weekend, which will help drive our recovery. Uh, but it's important for the reasons we talked about to also have strong public finances over time. Look, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. Given the scale of the shock we've experienced, the scale of the damage, this is going to take time to But to when, does it, when does it start, though? Because I, I, I know, obviously, it's not going to start before June. You've been very clear about supporting people until that roadmap ends. But should we be expecting for you to be focusing on rebalancing of those public finances in the near term, in this year? Well, I think what, what, what you want and what I want to deliver is support for our economy now when it needs it, support along that roadmap, helping to drive our recovery, but also levelling with people and being straight about the challenges we face over time because of the shock coronavirus has caused our public finances and making sure that we're clear with people about uh, an honest and fair plan to address that. And I think those things are both compatible. OK, well, let's talk about the honest and fair plan to address that. A lot of people will be saying that one way to address that is through tax rises. We currently have the lowest levels of corporation tax in the G7, 19%. Are we still going to have the lowest amount of corporation tax by the end of this parliament? Yeah, Sophie, unfortunately, it's difficult for me to talk about specific tax policy and specific taxes. I know it's frustrating for you, it'll be frustrating for your viewers, but the simple reason for that is taxes obviously have an impact on businesses and on markets, and it's not appropriate for a Chancellor to talk about those outside of a budget. Could it rise, though? Again, it's not, I, I can't talk about specific tax policies. It's unfortunate but appropriate that we, we leave that for budgets. So I okay. apologise for that. Well, let's, in that case, talk about your last manifesto then, because in your last manifesto, you said this. We will not raise... Hang on, not this. This is the tax rate. So, we will not raise the rate of income tax, VAT or national insurance. That was the election manifesto that you stood on. Are you going to stick to that promise? Again, you're, you're, you're asking me to talk about specific tax policy, and unfortunately, I, I'm I just can't... I'm asking if you're going to break an election promise. It's a bit different, isn't it? No, well, Fair we're enough. just we're, we're a couple of days in advance of a budget, and, again, tax policy is, is appropriately dealt with at, at the budget. Um, OK. Um, are you considering... Some people... There's reports in the papers today that you're considering freezing the amount at which people start paying the basic rate of income tax and the higher rate of income tax. Now, that wouldn't be breaking the pledge, but it would be stretching the pledge, wouldn't it? Look, I think, look, when, again, I can't, I, it's really difficult for me to talk about specific tax policy for the reasons that I've, I've explained. But taking a step back, you know, this is about, as I said, look, appreciating the damage that coronavirus has done to our economy, recognising the scale of the support that we've put in place, ensuring that we protect the economy through the rest of the crisis, support people and businesses as we emerge through the roadmap, but also making sure that our public finances over time are returned to a strong position so that we can respond to the next crisis, so that we're protected as interest rates may or may not change, and that we can deliver strong public services. That, that's, what, that's what we're going to do. And as, as Conservatives, I think people elect us to deliver those things, and, and I think that's okay. important. I understand you don't want to talk about specifics uh, ahead of a budget, but, you know, you've been Chancellor for a year, you've been in firefighting mode that whole time with the pandemic. I'm just trying to get a sense of what you actually are as a Chancellor, what the vision is. You know, are you, you know, a, a low-tax Chancellor? Do you want to cut taxes to help the recovery, to increase investment? Are you someone who wants to see a stimulus like Joe Biden? Are you someone who wants to increase taxes because you've got an eye on the state of the public finances? You know, what, what is the sort of Rishi Sunak vision? Well, I, I'm a Conservative and I believe in, in lower taxes. Look what's happened to us over the past 12 months. We've faced a shock unlike that which we've ever seen before and it required a very particular response from government. It required government and me to do things that I never imagined I would have to do, that no government would probably imagine they have to do. But I think I believe that was the right thing to do. You know, I stood up and said I would do whatever it takes to 
protect people and businesses through this crisis. Uh, I meant it. And that's what we've delivered over the past 12 months, an unprecedented amount of support for families and the economy at a very difficult time. Um, I mean to keep doing that and deliver on the things that we were elected to do, whether that's 50,000 more nurses, 20,000 more police officers, 40 new hospitals, to invest in infrastructure all around the country to level up opportunity. Those are the things people elected us to do, and they elected us to be responsible with their money, and that's what I plan to deliver. You, you say you believe in low taxes. Now, according to the Sunday Times, you told MPs last week that you want to plug the £43 billion black hole so you can cut taxes in a pre-election budget. I mean, that sounds an awful lot like playing politics with the recovery. Did you say that? No, I think, and in terms of specific numbers, I think it, 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 it's a bit hard for anyone to be precise about specific numbers. But did, given you, that, did you say that to MPs? Given, no, I don't recognise that, that figure, actually. I, the, being specific, so specific with numbers at this stage, when there's so much economic uncertainty, I, I don't think, actually, anyone could, uh, could do that. That wouldn't be the... That wouldn't OK, be able to, so you don't recognise the figure, but did you tell MPs last week that you want to cut taxes in a pre-election budget? I, I, I would like to be able to keep taxes low for people in general. That, I'm a Conservative and I believe in that. But I want to deliver our promises that we made to the British people, that we would be responsible with their money, that we would look after the nation's finances and we would deliver strong public services. And given the shock that coronavirus has caused us, I think it's right for me to have acted in the way that I have, provide the support that we are providing and will continue to provide. It sounds like you, and, did, it sounds like you did say this that you would you know, try and rebalance the, uh, the finances in the short term so you could cut taxes for pre-election budget. I think it sounds in, like you did. I think in the short term, what we need to do is protect the economy and keep supporting the economy through the roadmap. And over time, what we need to do is, is make sure that our public finances are sustainable. Uh, that's what we've been talking about, that levelling with people about what that's going to require. That, that isn't going to happen overnight. That is going to be work that takes time, given the scale of the shock that we've experienced. Uh, but if you're asking me, you know, do I want to deliver low taxes for people? Of course I do. Um, the difficulty, of course, uh, in some ways, uh, is going to be not the, the moment at this time when you've got the highest approval ratings in, in Cabinet, you're giving money away, you're trying to support people through the pandemic, but it's going to be the rebalancing. Are you worried that once you have to start taking money off people, then, you know, no amount of those slick Instagram posts are going to keep those approval ratings up? You know, I'm, I'm not worried about that, right? What I'm worried about is just trying to do the right thing at the right time and be honest and straight with people about what we're doing and why we're doing it and hopefully do things in a way that's fair and commands broad support. That, that's what you'll see on Wednesday and that's what I've tried to do throughout this crisis. Mm -hmm. throughout, talking about your sort of, your, throughout the crisis, as I said, you know, you're the most popular person in Cabinet, according to the polls. But, you know, when it comes to COVID, some would argue you've got quite a lot of things wrong. You've been on the wrong side of the argument. According to the University of Warwick, your Eat Out to Help Out scheme caused a significant rise in new infections and accelerated the pandemic into its second wave. Last September, you said that we must learn to live with it, live without fear. And according to the ONS, since September, what, 80, people, more than 80,000 people have died with COVID on their death certificate. Have you got some things wrong? Well, with regard to Eat Out to Help Out, actually, I think there's, there's many different studies and I don't agree with that uh, because if you look at it, Actually, areas where Eat Out to Help Out was used the most, for example, in the southwest, were the, the slowest to see any rise in infections and actually had very low infection rates. And almost all other major countries have had rises over the autumn and winter, and they didn't have Eat Out to Help Out. So I think it's a bit odd to, to ascribe uh, causality in that way. And what I was trying to do, and I think is the right thing to do, is try and protect the over 2 million people that work in the hospitality industry. They're often lower paid, younger women. I think as a matter of social justice, those jobs are really important for us to try and protect. And that's why I Today, we're announcing £5 billion of grants to help those businesses keep those jobs. That will always be very important to me. And, and as we look to the future, we will have to learn to live with coronavirus. It, vaccines, we're going to roll them out and, and we will have a very successful rollout of them and they are proving to be really effective, which is fantastic. You know, but no vaccine is perfect. And in the same way that we live with flu, you know, we will have to learn to live with coronavirus. That's something that you know, we're, we're, I think doctors would agree with. It, it, it will become something that we learn to live with like flu. So I think that is actually the, the right way to approach it. Um, just finally, while I've got you, I just want to ask you about Shimeon Begum. Um, she left the UK, of course, to join Islamic State when she was a schoolgirl. Uh, the Supreme Court recently ruled she can't return to the UK to fight that decision to strip her of her citizenship. Now, I don't want to talk about the rights and wrongs of her case, if she should be a citizen or not, but, you know, her go the government was able to take away her citizenship because her parents were born 
abroad, that they were born in a different country. So if someone whose parents had been born in this country had done exactly the same thing as Shamim Begum, she wouldn't have been treated in the same way. Is that fair? Are you comfortable with that? Well, I think I, I, I'm glad that the Supreme Court have made uh, made the decision that they have, and I think they've they've opined on the matter, and that's probably the right way for it to be. But do, are, you, are you comfortable with the fact that she would be treated differently if her parents hadn't been born abroad? Well, I think the Supreme Court decision supported what the government was trying to do, and I'm glad that it has, and I think that's the right decision in this case that we've been able to reach.